Coming up on the Angus Report, we look ahead to the final quarter of the 2018 cattle market. Missouri is the first state to enact a meat labeling law. We talk with the Missouri Cattlemen's Executive Vice President about the issue. Angus Genetics Incorporated Genetic Research Director Stephen Miller explains how you can use the new Angus Link scores in your operation. And we take a trip back in time with agriculture author and historian Maureen Ogle. This is The Angus Report. Welcome to the Angus Report. I'm Bob Cervera. And I'm Clint Mefford. This week, we look at what's ahead in the fourth quarter of the 2018 beef cattle market. The packing industry has seen an increase in the number of cattle coming into the feed yards and plants. And the number could continue to increase into the fall season. Beef cattle specialist at Certified Angus Beef, Paul Dykstra, explains where the market could head in 2018's fourth quarter. Well, it looks like as we move toward the fourth quarter here in late 2018, we currently have plenty of fed cattle supply. It looks like probably more than what the packer can manage today. So in the next handful of weeks moving forward, uh, in a very short period anyway, uh, that's going to probably work against the market and fed cattle values likely lower. That also combines with the seasonality as we move past the Labor Day holiday with kind of a break or a lull in uh, beef buying from a retailer and a food service perspective. So we'll likely see cutout values weaken as well into their first part of October. But both of those trends are also expected to turn higher, uh, those price trends, as we uh, work through some of these fed cattle supplies near term. And also as we move toward fourth quarter demand, that'll help both cutout values, particularly for prime certified Angus beef and choice product that'll be in demand for those holiday roasts. And also the fed cattle price tends to be a little bit less predictable in the fourth quarter from a standpoint of demand, but it looks like the supply headcount will get more friendly uh, to the fed cattle price in the fourth quarter also. Dykstra says the feedlot summer buying trends will end in the fall season. From a cow-calf perspective, I think the most predictably high part of the market is likely behind us this fall. Uh, just seems like the trend will be to some weakness into early October, although I will say that feed yard buying behavior has gone against what uh, some of the math would look like behind break-even calculations. So we can't be sure, but we do know that some, uh, some very exciting and high-priced buying is already behind us from the summer. So I'd anticipate a bit, of, bit more weakness into October, uh, but uh, certainly no disaster uh, from that standpoint. Visit blackinkwithcab.com for more information. On August 28, the new Missouri law changed the way non-meat products are labeled. The new statute requires companies to label meat only if it was harvested from production livestock or poultry. Missouri Cattlemen's Association Executive Vice President Mike Deering says the new law protects against lab-grown meat. You have currently kind of what's got it spurred this year. So you have debates in Washington, D.C. and the federal level debating who has regulatory authority over lab-grown or cultured uh, food products, um, whether it should be regulated by FDA or USDA. That debate's happening all over the country, and it's, it's a hot topic in Washington, D.C. at the moment. And Missouri, we thought, instead of waiting on Washington, D.C., let's put something in state statute that just clearly defines what is and what isn't meat and making sure that we mark it with integrity and that we educate and inform consumers about the products that they're buying. Um, uh, there's demand. There's people that want um, plant-based alternatives, and they should have access to those. But consumers, if they see a package and it says beef and it has a picture of a cow on it, um, they should have a reasonable assumption that it's probably beef. Um, so those products who are doing that will simply just have to put plant-based on the package, either before or after the product name. And then on the lab laboratory side, which which was the real intent of the legislation to begin with, since there's so much unknown about this relatively new product that's going to be hitting the market shelf soon. Want to make sure that people know that it was grown in a laboratory. And if it's regulated by FDA and not USDA, it will not be held at the same uh, level of scrutiny that traditional meat products are. It will not go through the stringent food safety protocols that exist for traditional meat to maintain that trust with our consumers. And, and it could be ruined very quickly if we do not 
work as an industry to protect our nomenclature, protect who we are, and protect the brand on our products. And it has nothing to do about one product versus the other. And we firmly believe in consumer choice. And people can are free to buy whatever they want. Visit MoCattle.org for more information. Stephen Shackelford is a meat scientist at the USDA Agriculture Research Service in Clay Center, Nebraska. He spoke on managing cattle for better meat quality at the 2018 Beef Improvement Federation. Uh, the feeding of cattle, uh, a grain feeding of high intensity, high energy ration, is, is the one thing that we do to ensure the highest product quality. Uh, some of the things that potentially can go wrong and, and cause quality or product quality issues is if cattle go off feed shortly before harvest. And that uh, long-term stress can result in the condition called dark cutting uh, that is a major value issue for the industry. One of the most disheartening things is to see a carcass that has a very high degree of marbling and would have qualified for the prime grade, but doesn't because it became a dark cutter. Shackelford also says there might be another tool in the future to help beef producers send fewer dark cutters to market. Dark cutting is a condition that we always thought was completely the environment. What happened to those animals before harvest? But it turns out uh, genetics has, has an impact. So if we select cattle that are less susceptible to dark cutting, then maybe that gives us a little more leeway if something goes wrong. We have some cattle that are dark cutting that become dark cutters when we think we did everything right. So hopefully with genetics, we can eliminate those cattle from the breeding herd and, and uh, get us over that hurdle. Genetic predictions aren't available yet, but they could benefit the industry. In late August, an atypical case of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, was confirmed in a six-year-old beef cow in Florida. There are two types of BSE, atypical and classical. Atypical, or sporadic BSE, appears to happen spontaneously in cattle, and it usually affects older animals. Prevalence of atypical BSE is not known, but scientists believe the disease affects fewer than one in a million cattle. Classical BSE is present when an animal ingests the infectious prion agent, such as meat and bone meal that has protein from infected rendered cattle. Since 1997, the FDA has prohibited the inclusion of mammalian protein in cattle feed. The feed ban was strengthened in 2009 when the FDA included a prohibition on all high-risk tissue materials in all animal feeds. The infected beef cow from Florida did not enter a slaughter channel or the food supply. The cow was tested at the Colorado State University Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory as part of a routine surveillance for cattle not fit for slaughter. This is the sixth case of BSE in the U.S. The first was classical BSE that was found in a cow imported from Canada in 2003. The other five cases have been atypical BSE. This case of BSE should not affect trade or the U.S.'s negligible risk status with the World Organization for Animal Health. Visit aphis.usda.gov for more information. Stay tuned. More from the Angus Report. Welcome back to the Angus Report. The 2019 National Western Angus Bull Sale will be here before we know it. America's largest meat supplier, Tyson Foods, expands its global market with a recent purchase. Rachel Robinson has more in our industry updates. The National Western Angus Bull Sale will take place during the National Western Stock Show again this year on January 16, 2019. New this year, bulls must be entered into both the National Western Stock Show and the National Western Angus Bull Sale to sell. The consignment deadline is fast approaching. Angus sale entries must be postmarked by October 1st, 2018. Visit angus.org for the entry form and more details. Tyson Foods, the largest U.S. meat supplier, announced the purchase of Keystone Foods for $2.16 billion. The purchase gives Tyson an even larger share in the global meat market. Tyson's acquisition includes six processing plants and an innovation center in the U.S. and eight plants and three innovation centers internationally. The deal is expected to close next year. 
We check in now on the latest cattle market news with our market update, brought to you by Cattle Facts. Hello, I'm Marcus Bricks with the Cattle Facts update. The Consumer Confidence Index climbed 133.4 in August, which is the highest value in 18 years. Consumers surveyed are optimistic about job and wage growth over the remainder of the year. The civilian unemployment rate was lower in July at 3.9%, dropping beneath the 4% level for the first time since the year 2000. According to Federal Reserve data, disposable incomes have grown 1.9% since the beginning of the year. Lastly, another bullish signal from consumer investors is a new all-time high price on the S&P 500 stock index. The S&P traded above 2,900 points for the first time on record Tuesday, August 28th, and made another new high the following day. The recent peak in the Consumer Confidence Index is a critical factor to understanding the resilience of demand at the retail level. Motor gasoline prices were nearly 20% higher in the summer months versus 2017, but motor vehicle miles driven were up almost 1 billion miles. Demand has also been stable at the retail level for beef so far this year. The major ways to evaluate beef demand calls for inspecting the elasticity of a few different factors. Beef prices are considered inelastic. That's the own price in elasticity of demand. So as beef price increases, the quantity demanded decreases, but by a smaller factor. The USDA all-fresh retail beef price was up six cents on average in the first half this year, only a 1% change over a year ago. Beef also has a cross-price elasticity with other protein sources like pork, and although beef prices are higher, retail pork prices have maintained a steady price ratio to beef. Retail beef prices averaged 1.5 times the price of retail pork in the first half of 2018 and 2017 alike, so that had a negligible effect on demand so far. Lastly, beef demand has an income elasticity, which is a measure of how beef demand changes as consumer income changes. Academic research shows as incomes rise, the demand for beef rises almost proportionately, so a rising disposable income is positive for demand. Overall, despite a tense political climate both domestically and abroad, the fact remains that consumer confidence is near record high. Factors of demand for beef are either steady or positive, so consumers are likely to continue buying beef until they feel like their economic situation changes. For the Angus Report and Cattle Facts, I'm Marcus Briggs. To learn more about Cattle Facts, your leading source for beef industry market information, visit cattlefacts.com. Next on the Angus Report, hear from Stephen Miller, Angus Genetics Incorporated Genetic Research Director. He talks about how Angus Link scores can help you select better Angus genetics for your operation. Stay tuned. The new American Angus Association feeder cattle program, Angus Link, uses indexes to score enrolled cattle. Stephen Miller, Angus Genetics Incorporated Director of Genetic Research, shares with us how producers can best use specific scores for their operation. So these scores that we put on feeder calves, the idea is really to translate genetic potential um, in terms of real terms that a feedlot or a commercial cattle buyer can understand it and use. The question often comes up, well, you know, do these, do these scores work? And well, behind those scores are really EPDs. And there's been, you know, decades of work done to prove that EPDs work. And we're just translating what we know about EPDs into, um, into performance potential in terms of profitability. So there's more than one trait that's important for profitability in the feedlot. You know, we've got, yeah, growth rate's one, but what about feed conversion, for example? Performance on the rail in terms of carcass weight and marbling and yield, all those things are important. So we apply economic principles to basically weight those traits appropriately, and then we put that in terms of a score. So these scores that we put on the commercial calves are directly, again, directly related to the economic indexes that have been, av been available on Angus cattle for quite some time, actually since 2004. They get updated, but uh, you know, economic values or these economic indexes on seed stock cattle is not new. Uh, putting, it, putting it into these commercial calves is relatively new. There has always kind of been a bit of a disconnect between the cow-calf side in terms of they buy bulls and they understand EPDs, but they sell their calves in the marketplace and they're 600 pounds in black and they've got these vaccinations, but the genetic information doesn't actually flow with those calves. So now we've actually taken that genetic information, you know, the bull history, 
um, you know, have breeders actually been selecting bulls that are above average for growth and marbling and these things that are important in the feedlot. And now we can distinguish between genetically really good 600 pound black vaccinated calves and calves that um, are 600 pounds in black, but not necessarily great for marbling and growth rate and actually putting a dollar value on those things. Miller explains what each index is. The indexes that are used with uh, Angus Link are, are basically the dollar beef, dollar feedlot, dollar grid values that um, breeders would be familiar with. But we've basically taken those and put them on a scale and basically benchmarked them uh, on the fly. So a, a, a commercial uh, breeder, when he's looking to select bulls, what he needs to look at is, is essentially that dollar B or dollar B value. That's our economic index on seed stock cattle, but that is directly comparable to the beef score that, that's put out on those feeder calves. So if he wants to improve the beef score on his feeder calves, he needs to buy bulls with a higher dollar B. Uh, if he wants to improve his feeder performance score or his grid score, likewise, um, selecting bulls with a higher uh, dollar feedlot, dollar F4, dollar G in terms of dollar grid. Visit AngusLink.com to learn more. Stay tuned. The meat industry is ever-changing to meet consumers' growing demands. Maureen Ogle, the author of In Meat We Trust, tells us the history of the meatpacking industry in the U.S. She tackles many misconceptions about beef production and gives us a glimpse of the past. The city, the crowds, the constant hurry and work. This is what city living is like for most Americans today. The one thing about people who live in towns and cities is they don't make their own food. That's so obvious we tend to forget about it. And the vast majority of Americans live in an urban place now. And that trend began really as soon as the American Revolution ended. Because so many people were moving to towns and cities, they needed farmers to produce food for them, including meat. That in turn shaped the system of raising livestock and producing meat. Everything flowed from that. The people who came here um, as colonists came from a world of scarcity. If, they, if there was a culture shock that these people experienced, it was that they realized that for all intents and purposes, as near as they could tell, there was no end to the land. And that allowed them to do um, the, the one thing that they regarded as the mark of a civilized people. It allowed them to establish uh, livestock husbandry and raise domesticated livestock. By the time the revolution ended, Americans simply regarded it as their absolute right. We are entitled to meet whenever we want it. Americans systematically kept pushing cattle production further and further west because as more cities grew, demand for land took land away from pasture and grazing. So you, ha so you had to keep moving, cattle kept moving further west. And a fairly large system of stockyards emerged in Chicago, St. Louis, and Kansas City, with Chicago being the largest, a place where, where shippers, drovers, Commission agents would bring in thousands and thousands of head of cattle and hogs so that they could be bought and sold, and then shippers would send the stock to these urban cities. Uh, butchers and slaughterhouse operators would then buy the livestock, parade them through the street, and take them to their shop. By the 1870s, Americans who lived in cities were sick to death of having to deal with this constant parade of animals through their streets. And they also became, frankly, and who could blame them, sick of having the stench and the muck and the constant blood flow through the streets from these slaughterhouses scattered all over. So in the 1880s, there was a great move on the part of city leaders and urban voters, as well as these uh, packing entrepreneurs, to s consolidate and centralize the system to try to move as much of the unpleasantness out of sight and out of mind. They decided to leave the slaughter in the West and only ship the carcasses and that completely transformed the meatpacking system. So this infrastructure emerged very sophisticated and very efficient for one purpose, and that was to feed people living in cities so that they could get the meat to which they felt entitled. 
from about 1890 to about 1930 or so, food prices in this country soared to a level we would never tolerate today. Urban consumers were extraordinarily demanding. They wanted cheap food. And it turns out that that long, prolonged period of high prices drove consumer frustration and caused riots, for example, caused meat boycotts, and we're not gonna eat any meat until you lower the price. But the, but the simple cause was the big gap between supply and demand. Farmers simply could not keep up with this urban demand. Consumers were getting sort of cheap food, sort of, but not exactly, and farmers were going broke right and left. And urban consumers and politicians and the USDA and even farmers even farmers said, we really must make a new model of agriculture because the one we have is not serving an urban nation. And, and farmers embraced things like confinement, the use of antibiotics, mechanized feeding operations, uh, mechanized watering operations, but all of it was driven by the need to ensure that farmers could earn a profit and consumers could enjoy low-cost food. Ultimately, we can trace everything to what consumers wanted, and someone was going to figure out how to do it. I think that given the demand we have for meat, not just in the United States, but we have a big demand for meat in the United States, given that and given how much of the rest of the world relies on Americans to make meat for them, I think we actually have a close to perfect system for doing that. I say close to perfect because, yeah, it would be just dandy if we could figure out some way to raise a lot of cattle without generating a lot of manure, but I don't know how you're going to do that. If somehow uh, concentrated feeding operations are banned, well, I think everybody's going to get a big wake-up call about the reality of what it would take to make this much beef without using these very efficient systems. It affects the least amount of land, air, and water, it affects the least amount of people negatively, and it benefits the most people by providing millions and billions of people with low-cost meat. You know, Bob, the beef industry has really come a long way. It sure has, and it'll be wonderful to see what happens in the future now. Yeah, it sure will. All right, that's all for this week's Angus Report. We'll return next week at this time for more cattle news and highlights. In the meantime, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Angus TV, for more from the association. Thanks for joining us.